Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, Robin. Thank you for having me. I'm great. Yeah, fantastic. Very good. Thank you. Uh, really excited to get the author of a paper on the show today. And you are one of the authors on the paper, Vision Transf Transformers for Satellite Image Time Series. Do you mind telling me a bit about what that's about? Yeah, so it's basically we are dealing with processing uh, satellite images at time series, which are um, it's like basically like video, but they come from satellites and they have irregular timestamps. And uh, what we're doing is we're proposing like an interesting architecture based on the vision transformer, but one that can account with um, with the time series data and the one that has some very interesting structural biases that make it particularly suited to satellite images, basically. Fascinating. And, and transformers originally were for natural language processing, so I guess they're good with sequences. So was it an obvious extension to go yeah. to time series? Yes, I, I mean, they, they, they were originally proposed for uh, sequences, as you say, but uh, they are better understood like general set uh, predictors, basically. They, can, they, they don't need the, the input to be particularly a sequence. It can be an, an order set. So there were some very interesting applications of these architectures in, um, in vision with the vision transformer who sees an image basically as a set of uh, patches. Uh, so as a, a, a yeah, so uh, an order, and uh, they don't use the interactive biases of convolution neural networks. And they have shown that uh, these architectures can work really well, basically, with very few modifications from the original uh, transformer, which is very interesting. Nice. And your first figure in the paper, it shows, you know, quite a simple diagram. Uh, and I guess the standard vision transformer has like the token embedding, as you say, patchified image and a spatial encoder. So it looks like the, the innovation here was to add the temporal encoder, or is there a little bit more to it than that? So uh, the, the reason we added the temporal and spatial encoder was to factorize input dimensions to, to make uh, the computation basically uh, tractable by our hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the, um, I think one of the innovations that we had and uh, which had a very important effect on performance is basically reversing the order of factorization. Because if you look into the video processing literature, you will find uh, it's, it's very common to find um, like a factorization, but it's always done in the reverse order. Mm. And uh, we go through into the paper about the reasons why that is so and why the reverse order is actually quite suitable for um, the type of... Uh, machine learning problems that we solve with satellite uh, images. And mm. it, has a, it has a very big difference, actually. That was the most important factor in the design. And it's, it's very simple. Right. And so that was a sort of a simple change that had a big impact on the training time and the training resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the uh, performance, mostly. Like that's so the final performance is also uh, oh, sensitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah well, like um, with a special then temporal encoder, this framework wouldn't work at all. Ah. Fascinating. Yeah. And I, I guess the, in the paper, you apply it to crop classification, but I guess for other kinds of time series tasks, the same approach will, will be suitable. It should be like it's a general purpose architecture. Um, we also apply it in object classification with a few changes and it still performs very well. So yeah, I'm assuming like for uh, satellite data, it should work uh, really well. I mean, like um, the temporal uh, special factorization should, wouldn't be ideal if you wanted to track objects. Um, in successive images, mm. uh, but for for problems like crop recognition, uh, it has a lot of good uh, qualities. Fantastic, and I think in the paper you applied it to Sentinel two imagery, which I guess is relatively low resolution. Um, does does this approach will it be suitable for very high resolution imagery as well? Uh, it might be a bit tricky to um, uh, because of the complexity of the model. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm not so sure, but there are there are papers which use vision transformers for natural uh, language, uh, sorry, for natural images processing, which do very well for segmentation tasks as well. Mm. So, so, so I imagine like with the right modification, then yes, this this framework should work. All right, and just to like lift the lift the hood on the the R and D process itself, like how much like effort is it to modify an architecture and create like the changes that you implemented? Uh, well, it, it depends uh, really like, um, so initially I was, I was working with transformers because I wanted to take advantage of uh, some properties that uh, you, you find during self-supervision. Uh, and I wanted to test basically some, some basic architectures, not to propose a new one with, with this, but, um, uh, 
I mean, d- during ablations, basically, we found out an architecture that was very, very promising. And after that, it took uh, it took a good three or four months to to finalize the the architecture with all the hyperparameters. You know how to train it and and everything. Right, right. So there was a bit of a, I guess, a luck in finding that really well performing <laughs> solution. Yeah, yeah. In in a, in a sense, then you then you have to understand why that is happening. Like um, th- there might be some cases where it's not explainable, but in this case, I think we, we found out some some reasons why. Fantastic, and um, the results that you achieved they they seem to be significantly better than the benchmark uh, convolutional based approaches. Do you think that this is going to have a big impact on downstream applications? You know, obviously, crop uh, classification. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it possible to like you know talk a bit more about what the impact of this work will be? Yeah. Um, so basically, if, if you look at the, the seeds classification and segmentation literature, you will find that the, the models that are the best performers are not the ones that's the ones that were proposed for natural images, which mm. tells you something like the, the, the domain is actually quite different. So uh, I think like this problem is still bounded to some extent by you know by the search for better and better architectures, and th- this one actually is uh, makes uh, some strides forward. It mm. has a, a significant gap in performance, so I think it it is towards the right direction. Uh, now, for commercial applications of the of these uh, these models, I think uh, there is still some uh, some performance gap that needs to be crossed to make mm. it very very reliable. Uh, but uh, when that will happen, and um, I mean this this is a problem that will be solved in my opinion that's going to have very significant uh, effects on people's lives basically mm. Mm. so so you 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 can think of uh, land monitoring uh, which uh, will be automated by this approach and that is very like very significant because it can allow you to design the you know the whole food pro- production process and optimize it in various Absolutely. ways so, yeah like for uh, um, sustainability, resilience, or even uh, like optimization of uh, you know the quantities of food uh, produced, mm. and um, like in the in developing countries, there might be even more uh, important applications like the the capacity to 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 insure people who who were previously uninsurable because uh, um, like um, monitoring for for insurance can be very costly. Mm-hmm. In in those regions, and if you can automate it by models uh, like this, and uh, you know its cousins, basically, yeah, uh, that that would have a huge cascade effects on people's lives. That's really exciting and and really good to hear. Uh, you did make another point that I just want to pick up on. You mentioned that some of the architectures were better on natural vision data sets. I mean, the data the data set itself presumably has a big impact, you know, for the pre training on the end result. Um, and those natural image architectures would have been trained on like Coco or some other like standard image data sets. So in your case, did you did you also do the same sort of pre-training on those standard data sets or was there a different approach? No, I mean, for, for this paper, we, st- we begin from uh, random initialization. We don't do any any pre-training here. Okay. It was, yeah, like the, the contribution was the, the architecture itself. Uh, now pre-training in crop recognition and remote sensing, I mean, it's an active topic of research. Mm. Uh, on its own, it's clear that like, uh, the distribution of satellite images is very different from uh, natural images, especially like when you look at Sentinel-2, mm. which, as you said, has, it has a quite a low resolution. Mm. Uh, however, like uh, previous studies have shown that ImageNet initialization actually works, uh, which I, I'm not sure we understand the reasons why this is so, because mm. you know it's completely different objects in the two, two domains. Absolutely. And just so we can understand where, you, where you're from, you're a researcher at Imperial College, is that right? Yes, in the Department of Computing. Imperial Fantastic. College. And what kind of activities are people doing there that will be related to this uh, paper? Uh, I mean, uh, this this is in collaboration with, uh, with some collaborators from the Imperial College Business School. Uh, mm. who are actually interested uh, a lot in uh, insurability. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said before, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, like, uh, I'm, like for this paper, I'm mostly uh, collaborated, with, uh, with, of course, with my, my supervisor and uh, with economists, basically. 
Right, that's really interesting. So, that, were they guiding the use case that you should design towards, or yes, yes, like uh, guiding towards uh, towards the target. What we want to achieve is uh, we want to achieve good um, performing models for crop tire recognition, uh, yield mm. predictions, and uh, similar problems. Fantastic. Well, it's been really good to catch up and hear about uh, the details of the work. If people want to follow along uh, your your future publications, uh, where's the best place for them to do that? Oh, you, you, you can have a look at my, my GitHub, uh, basically, and my Google Scholar profile. And um, yeah, you can find my email and contact me for details. I'm very happy to respond. Fantastic. I'll put that in the show notes. And once again, so much for thank, uh, for joining me today. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Thank you.